looks like we're live now. So I guess, oh, we have one minute left. We'll wait, wait for a little bit. Okay. All right, hello everybody, and thanks for joining today's session on measuring the ROI of advocacy. Um, my name is Truman, and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager over here at Influitive, and I head up all of our advocacy marketing initiatives. And as discussed in the title, we're going to be talking about the uh, ROI of advocacy, and sometimes I like to call it the uh, return on advocacy uh, itself. Um, and just as a, as a front note, uh, everyone measures ROI in general differently. You know, companies are different, they have different priorities, different ways in, in measurements. So if we could all keep this in mind that, you know, today I'd really like us to focus on just the methods and the ideas uh, for tracking the ROI of uh, any type of advocate marketing program. And uh, I'm not going to do that myself. I have two all-stars uh, joining us today. They're incredibly smart and talented advocate marketers. We have Kevin Lau, the Senior Marketing Manager of Customer Retention and Advocacy at NetBase and Carlos Gonzalez, the Vice President of Customer Success Operations over at Ceridian. Um, I'm not going to steal the thunder though, so what I want to do is I want to actually turn it over to them, talk a little bit about uh, themselves, the companies they're from, and essentially their after marketing strategies. So uh, Kevin, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, thanks Truman for inviting me to uh, the uh, hangout today. So my name is uh, Kevin Lau. Um, I've been a long-time Influitive customer now for over three years at this point. Um, currently, work at a company called NetBase. We do social media analytics and listening, um, primarily, primarily servicing um, large brands, consumer brands, and agencies. So a lot of our customers are like Walmart, Visa, um, you know, Samsung, etc., and then also marketing agencies like Ogilvy and McCann. Yep, heard a few of those uh, small mom and pop companies. Um, and yeah, let's uh, flip it over to Carlos. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the company that you're from. Hey Truman, this is Carlos Gonzalez. Uh, hello everybody, thanks for having me today. Uh, delighted to be here. We've been partnering with Influitive since early 2013. I'm uh, Vice President of Customer Success Operations with Ceridian <clears throat> and uh, we are a, a global human capital management uh, uh, solutions provider and we have uh, solutions in, in over our, our customers in over 50 countries. Um, offering includes our, our award-winning Dayforce product, and uh, we've had our, our program live since early 2013. Perfect. Great. Great. And um, so, let's let's talk about uh, your advocate marketing program and the strategy uh, that you've developed um, prior to formalizing a uh, program with Influitive. Um, could you discuss a little bit about you know what you were doing before and uh, essentially how were you tracking and measuring the results? What were the priorities? Um, tell us a little bit about the before the formalized program. Uh, Kevin, let's start with you. Cool. Um, yeah, before we started using Influitive, um, a lot of the stuff we were trying to get was related to um, more involvement from our customers. So how to turn them from just a regular uh, end user to someone that was really a, a fan or a super fan. Um, and this is before like I had any idea of what African marketing was and, and how it really worked. But um, you know, essentially, I was looking at the basic stuff like the likes, the shares, the comments that people post on social, um, asking for you know case studies and uh, video testimonials and that type of stuff. But it was very manual and it wasn't scalable. And so we had to really figure out things and and how to build out forums and communities that uh, would essentially be able to pull people together and get um, the knowledge share from everyone, and it was very, it was pretty difficult to do so. Right, so it sounds like it was very ad hoc, um, you know, one-offs that you had to somehow manage to centralize. Yeah, I would say it's probably, it was back in the day when it was definitely like uh, the growing pains of trying to figure out how to leverage your customer base. Right, right. Uh, Carlos, what about you? Is it any different from Kevin's or? Um, um, well, similarly, we, we actually uh, launched our customer advocacy program December of 2012, and within a few months, we realized we needed something to operationalize the engagement of our customer base. Uh, that uh, an Excel spreadsheet and just our tribal knowledge of who's who was not going to not going to cut it. Uh, we also wanted to uncover that needle in the haystack customer who would become a, a super advocate, and we, we needed a way to operationalize that. Um, and we uh, we also firm believers that the 
that Ceridian success is the sum total of our customer successes. Uh, we wanted to emphasize the great things our customers were doing and have them talk about that in public. So we needed some kind of platform to do that. Uh, Pre-formal program, this was uh, all by chance. Uh, we had a phenomenal marketing group creating phenomenal marketing components, but not really a, an advocacy program. Right, right. So as you mentioned, just by chance. Where so mm -hmm. where uh, Kevin was really counting the likes and the shares and trying to you know count the number of case studies that he would try to reach out for. Um, from what I understand, for you, you really did rely on chance to see which happy customers would kind of raise their hands to do things, almost like I guess in the beginning asking for a reference in a way. Right. We had lists of lists of customers who, you know, at one time said yes, we're we're a delighted customer and we'd be happy to do this or that. But no one was really managing that ongoing relationship. So maybe they would be acquired, or maybe they would move on, or switch products. And then knowing that in real time, and if they're available to do something or engage, was all very manual, very difficult process. So it, we really didn't have a formalized process for that. Um, and we also were uh, taking messages and trying to package that, and then sending it out on, you know, from the Ceridian voice. We didn't have a way of getting our customers to present that information for us. Right. Okay. So now that we've moved away from uh, Excel spreadsheets and chance and uh, leaving that all up, uh, what metrics? And Carlos, so this is one. Uh, we'll start with you. What metrics do you choose to measure when you start using Inclusive, and how has that really changed over time? You know, right off the bat, we started with you know how many core super references do we have for our our flagship product, and we kind of use that as a baseline of of our success in engaging the customers. But then, and we still track that to this date. But now we've gone to a deeper level of not only the core Uber advocates, as we like to talk to them or, or refer to them as, you know, our super partners, but also what are um, what groups of people are willing, ready, and able to do something else. We, we keep track of people who are interested in speaking at our user conference every year, people who, who have an interest in being part of a customer advisory board, product advisory board, you know, that population of very specific uh, skilled customers who would be great for a media engagement, I've got a, a little list of them, uh, social media thought leaders, people who, who their personal goal is to be more engaged in social media on human capital management. That's a unique subset of our customers. We have populations of customers who are uh, interested in sharing their experiences in regional webinars where we, we have lunches. We call them dine and day forces. Uh, they'd like to get out, meet other customers, network with Ceridian uh, management, and at the same time share their experiences as a thought leader. Uh, we track those. We track uh, mentors, people who, who want to pay back to their own community. They've, they've been there, done that, had phenomenal success, and now they want to be positioned as a thought leader. We have a group of uh, HCM mentors, we call them. Right. So it sounds like a lot like now you're able to, instead of having it by chance uh, and applying a spreadsheet, you can have a broader overview of what your customer base is, uh, is really doing to help advocate for, for Ceridian and kind of to track their sentiment. Yes, it's, it's kind of like um, our internal customers can go into uh, or go you know engage our customer success department and and really have inventory of assets of these customers who are willing to do things or who want to do these uh, things because of the intrinsic value to the customer, but then also the value to Ceridian. Uh, so it's it's incredibly powerful to have this you know, to track that inventory of assets um, that are systematically built up through engagement. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So you heard it, folks. You know, Carlos is uh, right here tracking mainly based on inventory, um, and uh, to, as a way to also personalize, engage the success of customer themselves. Um, but hey, what does Kevin do? What does Kevin do over at NetBase? I don't know. Let's ask him. What do you What do you do, Kevin? Um, yeah. So for us, I mean, I've seen it evolve and change over time. You know, at NetBase and also at previous companies. But uh, one of the big things we look at is the engagement rate. So we look at how many advocates are joining, how many people are engaged on a monthly basis. Um, how do we take them from just that basic customer to really become one of our most trusted authorities in terms of being a social influencer? How can they also help us with case studies and videos? But initially it was all about engagement and, and how to essentially impact um, you know, the retention rate for our customer base. So we looked at, um, we have a tiering system for all of our customers, and so initially we did like onboarding with, um, you know, our tier three customers, tested it out, 
and then we start to see like what is it that people are most engaged about and what do they like talking about and and how do we really get um, them to be interested in things that we're, we're looking at too so right. eventually we found over time that um, besides engagement a lot of these people saw themselves as actual thought leaders in the space like they've they live and breathe social social listening analytics. Um, they work for these large organizations. They want to kind of build up their own career path and what they're doing, um, so they can get you know job promotions and whatnot. And so we found that a lot of them wanted to be public speakers. They wanted to be participating in advisory boards, uh, kind of just like Carlos mentioned too. Um, and we gave them opportunities to then basically tell their story. And right. by default, they just became you know our best customers. Um, essentially, they became references. We started compiling lists of some of our best users. Um, we put together private groups just for those folks. Um, we're also launching a, a, a um, customer conference end of this year, so this is our first one that we're actually doing. And so, this is helping us source um, some of our best customers from Coca-Cola to Walmart to Yum Brands uh, to be our biggest advocates and take center stage. Uh, and also, we got a little bit more into how can we build out marketing collateral that not just our team can utilize, but the rest of the company. And so there's all there's always been this big um, interest in getting more use cases and stories pulled out. And so um, we put a huge push on this this year. And um, just this past year, we've had over actually just this past quarter, we've produced over 55 new marketing assets. So 25 of those have just been videos from some amazing brands and thought leaders in the space and then another 30 uh, uh, case studies just in the past like 90 days and so um, that's a testament to what we've been able to do just using Influitive's platform um, and then this even this summertime we still have another 47 of people just raising their hand saying hey I want to be in a video I want to be in a case study when can we make this happen right so right extremely so valuable for us great, great. So what happened oh, oh sorry about that it's like, like a little bit of feedback from your side sorry. Uh, here, I'm going to meet you for a second, Kevin. Um, so from what it sounds like, Kevin, uh, you're basically saying like the top level uh, metric that you look at is mainly engagement. And I remember actually, Carlos, one of our previous conversations was, hey, you know, how do we go about really nurturing that relationship with our customer? So is it safe to assume that like on a very preliminary level, you should at least be, tr that you are tracking engagement um, for, um, as a part of your program? And Kevin, this goes out to you. Um, I muted you, but I'm trying to see if I if you can unmute yourself. Uh, let's see. You got it. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, we, we track engagement um, pretty heavily. Um, and the other thing is we look at, um, obviously there's spikes when, when people are more active in our hub than, than others. Um, it tends to dip down a little bit just in the summertime. But um, that is one of the big things we look at. But we also look at, um, while they're engaged, what type of activities are they really interested in doing? So that helps us uh, dictate what type of future content we want to push out to them. Mm -hmm. um, it also helps us determine, um, like, how is it going to impact you know, potential upsells, renewals, all that kind of stuff. So we look at essentially like the life cycle of the customer. Right. And we do that by positioning mm -hmm. the challenges and also the segmentation that's available in, in using Influitive. Um, which has been really valuable for us. And then um, we really try to create those personal relationships with our customer base. So typically, um, I guess in a lot of B2B organizations, you typically have your account manager, your account executive that works directly with um, the client in terms of renewing them and developing that relationship. But we've also looked at how, we, how marketing can get a better um, foothold in those, um, in those organizations. So that way, in case like a client leaves or... Um, in case there's like new onboarding that takes place, we want to be able to develop that relationship within the entire company so that we solidify it so that it actually makes it stronger, especially when it comes time for renewals or things come up. Definitely. And from what it sounds like, the, the more stronger the relationship, the stickier it gets. And all that basically stems from how do you engage your customer first and then, again, nurture that relationship. So. Right. Kevin, you brought up a good point there, is that you know you mentioned several times that, hey, the way you nurture the customer in and then start talking about like how it relates to retention and other types of value. Um, so one of my next questions is, you know, how do you tie in monetary value you know, to your program? Um, good question. So one of the one of the things we actually started experimenting more this year 
Um, I mean, referrals was always a sort of a, a big thing, but um, initially it was all about how do we just get our customers onboarded so that way we can start building those relationships and then get to the point where we can start asking them for referrals and references. Um, we did a, a summer uh, contest last year, and then we did our second one this year. Um, we actually just wrapped it up a couple weeks ago. Um, it was basically called like NetBase Spring Awakening, and, and the premise was uh, essentially just submit as many referrals as possible, and we'll do a raffle to see who the grand prize winner is. We gave away um, $5,000, or valued at $5,000, uh, VIP tickets to our user conference, um, you know, hotel stay, airfare, that type of stuff. Um, and so what we found over the course of 60 days we launched the contest, um, we generated 149 referrals. Um, we were actually skeptical if we were actually going to generate any referrals at all, but we uh, we ended up hitting a pretty good mark. Um, we generated over 200,000 in new pipeline from just that one contest, and so we're doing another contest in um, uh, beginning of August. And we've also, just besides referrals alone, we've also seen a huge spike in the number of reviews that we've seen. So um, essentially sites on like Trustradius, G2 Crowd, um, those types of places, we saw four times increase in the number of, number of new reviews. And these have been just story after story that we've been using on our own website. Um, and also helped us solidify the relationship with being able to get, um, you know, case studies, videos, um, you know, speakers for webinars, for, uh, for trade shows, etc., stuff like that. Um, we also have these field events that we call meetups, and essentially they're like cocktail hours. Um, we've added just this year alone over a million dollars in pipeline generated just because um, customers were, were able to participate in these events. They were able to be speakers on customer panels. Um, it helped us close new business, and so it has been one of the most successful marketing campaigns that we've done to date. Um, it's helped us with upsells and opportunities, so we actually use it for, in our discussions, um, in our forums, we post new product releases and new, um, new products, and we ask people, hey, if you're interested in learning more, um, getting on a demo, or learning from your account manager on how you can potentially add this to your arsenal of social listening tools, um, so that's added more in terms of just upsell opportunities, um, and like I mentioned, just new marketing collateral that we've been able to produce, too. Right, right. So this is some really, really good stuff, um, and I, I want to dig uh, slightly deeper into it in terms of the, the how aspect. Um, like you mentioned with upsell opportunities, essentially all you did was you've used your program to educate your uh, advocates or your customers about some of the product offerings that you have, and from what it sounds like, if they're interested, then they can raise their hand or talk to um, their uh, CSM and then on the back end, you attribute, I don't know, within your, your own uh, Salesforce or CRM, a campaign attached to it, and that's how you kind of see uh, what impact you're having? Yeah, exactly. So we, we use Salesforce. We track everything through Salesforce to determine, um, you know, where is, our mark, where is our marketing dollars being spent the best, and um, is it making an impact to the bottom line? And so um, within, within marketing or customer marketing, our program, specifically within Fluidive, has been uh, hands-on like the most successful campaign that we've run within marketing besides, you know, the general, um, you know, demand gen emails and stuff like that. So it's contributed a lot. Um, it's also impacted just other parts of the organization. So in terms of just like time savings and um, support requests that have come in from our, uh, you know, limiting the burn that um, our support team has to deal with like individual uh, issues that come up, we've been yeah. able to learn a lot of that just by having this community open and also allowing um, uh, customers to essentially help sell to each other. So when there's like a new offering that comes out, they'll talk about some of the use cases if they are an existing customer, they'll help sell it, and they'll also help address some of those questions that come up a lot. So the frequently asked, okay. it's, been, it's been extremely valuable from that. Got standpoint. it, got it. So we'll actually, we'll dive into that a little bit more. I just feel like right now we haven't haven't shown uh, Carlos enough love in this uh, in this session, so we're going to flip the switch and uh, hand it over to Carlos uh, again. So, Carlos, you know, how do you tie monetary value back to your program? Thanks, Truman. Uh, I love everything that, that uh, Kevin was mentioning, and we do some quite a few of the similar uh, tracking methodologies. We're also uh, integrated with Salesforce, uh, so we can you know we can tie their activities back to individuals in Salesforce. Uh, it was really revealing to see when when people ask like who's your most valuable customer and uh, you know the knee jerk response is well who's 
you know, which one of our customers is, is uh, paying the most PEPM per month or something like that. Uh, but we did some return and advocacy analysis. So we took some of our Uber advocates and we took a look at, okay, the easy things to, to calculate our, you know, reference conversations that they had. What uh, was the dollar value opportunities for those reference conversations? Uh, that was really eye-opening. But then we also had the same uh, uh, advocates uh, do one-to-many webinars. And the attendees in the webinars were prospects tied to uh, opportunities in Salesforce. So you have one person being interviewed as a thought leader. Again, we give our, our customers opportunities, as Kevin mentioned, opportunities to be thought leaders, uh, to show uh, their experiences, that, uh, they're, you know, that they've been there, done that. They have a tremendous amount of credibility and knowledge. They're very successful. So we give them opportunity to, to share this in peer engagement webinars. Um, we interview them in front of uh, sometimes dozens of, of prospects who ask questions about their experiences, what they learned, uh, things like that. And after those, we take a look at the attendees and see which opportunities they're tied to. And we identify oftentimes millions of dollars in pipeline impacted by the, you know, the one advocate. It's a fantastic way to really show some, some ROI, some tremendous impact that you know, one customer can have. We found one grocer in Wisconsin, a relatively small company, had uh, $39 million in impact you know, compared to maybe one of our larger customers who is you know, a, a phenomenal client, very successful, but for, for their purposes, they don't want us to use their brand name, so they're not advocating for us. So when you think about that, which customer really is our most valuable ad, uh, customer? Probably that advocate who's impacting so many other clients. Um, that's, yeah, that's, and that's really, really interesting because I know, you know, we will we'll talk about um, just like, you know, the cost, uh, you know, per, per customer and, you know, is it really just like how much do we market to them and, you know, how much uh, do they bring back in? But we never, you know, I don't think a lot of us do. I think about what is the value added after. Right, and your mm -hmm. comparison is actually quite refreshing to see. Like, okay, you know, besides logo and uh, besides how much they bring in themselves, like, what are the other things that they're doing in the marketplace yeah. to really help push my business forward? So that's really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, moving along, uh, Carlos, I wanted to ask you um, because I remember you mentioning beforehand about just let, let's say um, you know ways in which your advocates network with each other and how that saves a little bit of time amongst your team to help coach them into successful customers. Um, how, how do you go about um, attributing like cost savings or time savings to, to that piece? Like how, how, do you, how do you think of XOXO as a way to yeah, save time and, and costs? Uh, great question. So um, our program is affectionately branded the XOXO program. Uh, we love our customer success and, and uh, it, it's a fun program. Uh, we've created a component in our program called XXO Match, where customers can network with other customers, kind of like online dating. Um, they can either hang a shingle out saying who they are and who they want to network with, or pose a question to other customers. Sometimes um, Certain has phenomenal support. We have great project management, but sometimes they want to, well, grocer wants to talk to another grocer, or you know, a financial company wants to talk to a financial company, uh, but they want to talk to someone in their state or their region about something that's geographically relevant to them. So we've provided this forum, and we've uh, fostered hundreds and hundreds of introductions from customer to customer where uh, they find themselves answering each other's questions. So instead of picking up the phone and logging a ticket and calling support, we have them uh, talking to each other, answering each other's questions, and, and starting these relationships. So they have this phenomenal support group um, that, that we've helped introduce. So just think of the, uh, for your support departments, the cost of one ticket or one less ticket but not only one time, that ongoing uh, support mechanism. So our, our most successful customers have this. They use our support engagement, the resources, the customer success manager. They also have a community of other customers that they engage with. Um, so it really makes it a, a, a powerful you know, improvement to their, their overall experience. They share best practices, and they're uh, lightening the load on our support resources. Got it. And uh, so, Kevin, back to your point, is this very similar to uh, net-based VIP? Yeah, um, we do have uh, we do have opportunities where, where customers um, can engage with each other, and a lot of the times, uh, and one of the reasons why we do so much um, like field events, and also why one of the big selling points of using Influtive was how do we get customers to engage with each other um, and create opportunities where they can. Uh, 
answer each other's questions and create this community where they're able to reduce the amount of um, frequently asked questions that come up to our support teams, our customer success teams. Um, so that has been a huge impact for us. I'd say probably if I had to put a dollar amount to it, it's probably, or a percentage, it, we've probably seen like a 15% um, you know, savings just in terms of like the time required for our team to have to answer those same questions that come in. Right, right. So that's been been really huge. And then I think we're actually going to see it drop, uh, you know, make a bigger impact, especially since we just launched a knowledge base, um, online help support tools that um, we're going to start promoting and branding within VIP. Um, and so that's been, you know, tremendously valuable from the support side. Um, and also it's been helping us just with, you know, some of our Tier 3 accounts, which we don't necessarily have face-to-face -face, um contact as frequently as maybe like our tier one and tier two customers okay. uh, helped us uh, streamline a lot of those support issues that come up too. Got it, got it. I forgot to ask you about what tier three meant. Um, so tier three specifically means customers that may have not uh, paid the full service package, but you know, you're like, hey, you know, you're in this bracket because um, of the, of the things that you, things that you purchased uh, through NetBase. Yeah. So it, it might be just like a basic subscription. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're a SaaS model uh, product, so it's essentially, you know, we start them off at a lower level maybe, and then they expand and grow their program. So that's ultimately how we kind of look at success, too. It's not just retaining that customer, but how much they're actually growing over time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just for the audience, from what it sounds like, um, as a way to measure uh, just how the cost savings of, of, of a support ticket or the way that you can create a, a much stickier uh, community, it sounds like you you could always just measure like uh, I guess the the activity in your community what uh, the activity was like before and after um, and that also involves uh, you know, your support team as well. Um, but we're gonna head on to the next question and it was this was actually sourced from our very own uh, community uh, discussions and uh, a few of our advocates wanted to ask you know how how would you show our on some of the harder harder Oh, I'm, I'm going to mute, mute you, you, Kevin. Um, so, uh, you know, again, a few of our advocates in our community, you know, want to ask about the ROI on some of the things that are harder to really pin down, you know, the benefits and intangibles like brand awareness or like product feedback. So, uh, Carlos, I'm going to uh, go with you first and ask, like, how, how do you go about pinning that down? Um, you mentioned XOX, uh, XOXO match. Um, could you like give us a little sense of how, how you guys do it? Sure. But, well, the, there's the the easy low hanging fruit of ROI of, of advocacy, which is references and directly impacting opportunities. But then you have uh, additional departments. We we really think that the answer to most departments' issues can be found in the customer base. So thinking out, you know, everyone's thinking of marketing and sales, but you know, what about other parts of the company? Uh, engineering, for example, in a matter of of a couple of months, we brought forth 200 customers to do user acceptance testing. And in, uh, in thinking about this conversation, I asked uh, um, our director of, of, uh, from testing, uh, Matosha Bias, who's on our team, said, you know, how does, how does this impact you? And she said, it's, it's phenomenal. The, the cycle time is shorter. The quality goes up. Um, so you know, if you're looking at engineering, I've asked um, a product, our product management team, um, how does uh, having access to customers, either through surveys or through quality control, impact engineering? Um, he, he went from, you know, he said he had a group of engineers guessing at what customers wanted in certain verticals to actually being able to look at a bench of customers in a certain vertical market, in a certain strategic, you know, client size, employee population size, ask pointed questions, uh, ask surveys and deliver surveys and have really detailed information come back from the exact target market that they're trying to develop the, the product for. Um, he says it, it shortens sales cycles. Uh, it, it ramps a learning curve for the engineers who, you know, they're not banking experts or grocery experts or manufacturing experts. They're they're human capital management development experts. It really bridges that. So all of a sudden, on our engineering team, we have the best vertical market experts who are helping us advance our products. So then, when the product comes out, it's it's comfortable to those vertical markets. Um, that's been a phenomenal impact. Um, so it, it, you know, if you can cut your engineering cycles, you know, by several percentage points, you know, 10% shorter cycle time or your, your QA cycles dramatically, 
That's awesome. Uh, we've also, uh, our HR department, um, Ceridian's a phenomenal place to work. We're growing, you know, recruiting uh, the best talent. Um, we have customers who have uh, looked at every solution in the marketplace, probably worked with some phenomenal salespeople or service people in the past. Um, you know, who would you like to, you, you've selected Ceridian, but who would you like to work with again as a Ceridian employee? Our customers send us referrals for, for new employees, things like that. You know, what's the cost of onboarding one more employee or finding that next great Ceridian employee? Well, that's also uh, one of the benefits of, of our program is, is actually bringing people in that way. Wow, your uh, your your team is very selfless, considering that you could have just kept it within um, customer success and, and marketing. But hey, share the love, right? Yeah, I, I think most every department uh, that we can think of, you know, when you think about what their objectives are, the answer more often than not is is in our customer base. Yeah, and that's really interesting about the cycle time. I I, I do agree that hey, if you can get to the advocates that are really passionate about your product. Uh, or if you match them up with other customers and have your team listen in, you could really uncover some key nuggets that maybe might take you a while to recruit for a user group or a product feedback session. We, we've also, the nature of the XOXO program is that we're, we're not challenging them to do something for us. We're providing them with opportunities to the, do something that has intrinsic value to the customer. So we have a lot of customers. You know, in our customer base, we have extroverts and introverts and people who are HCM geeks in the best way possible, and we have people who are saying, gee, I wish I knew how this was being developed, or what's coming down the pipe, something like that. We reach out to those customers and say, you know, you've shown an interest in what's coming down the path for product. Why not collaborate with us on the development of the next generation product? Give us that feedback. Be part of our UAT testing. Um, yeah. Give us uh, A-B testing and engineering. They get so excited by that, um, the customers are happier. So mm -hmm. you know, their their retention goes up. Our uh, We survey our, our net promoter score within our community. And in the general population, it's strong in all areas, but in the community, is always higher. They just seem to be more engaged uh, customers. And we, we invite everyone into the community. So it's, it's so exciting to see that you know, they're, they're a customer of ours, but they're also a business partner. They're helping us develop. They're helping us recruit a better team. Um, we're all you know, marching together towards success. And it's, it's, our customers are such a big part of that, that uh, the line between certain employee and, and certain customers, it's, it's blurred. Right, right, because they, they feel like, yeah, they're a part of the team, right? They're invested yeah. in your success. Um, ha have you done any initial uh, look, like, comparisons between, like, those that are in the community and those outside? Like, w is there a percentage point type of difference, or, like, what do you see? Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a higher, just from the MPS number itself, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just dramatically higher within the, within the program. Within the program, eh? Yeah, okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, and you measure it by like you basically compare like all the members that are in XOXO and all those that haven't had a chance to be invited or are typically new. For those who, who you know, some people decline or they they're okay. not interested or, or things like that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay, so we're gonna switch gears and go over to Kevin. So Kevin, I'm gonna unmute you and uh, yeah, same question. Like, how do you measure the ROI of those intangibles, right? Like the brand awareness, you know, like and the product feedback. Um, what do you do? Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, one of the biggest things for in our space, like, you know, it's very competitive. Um, to be honest, like 70% of new business actually comes from our existing client base. So it, that's a huge number for us. So we're always looking about how can we make sure that our customers are happy, engaged, and, and just overall just, you know, having a good experience using the product and everything else. So similar to what Carlos said, we use it... Um, a lot in terms of just like beta testing new products, um, looking at the roadmap. Um, our product team loves the feedback that we get on new releases. Um, that helps them really hone in on what uh, what they need to change or what they need to advance in the future. Um, and the other thing that's it's hard to put an exact dollar amount to it, but like putting together an advisory board. I mean that that in itself has you know tremendous impact on the overall organization. Um, and across the team, you know, especially executive team, I mean, they see the impact just in terms of the feedback that we're getting from customers, um, the knowledge sharing. They obviously see the deals are getting closed, um, and also just having like a customer conference that has that was actually positioned and pushed out just because customers wanted it. So um, that's been something that's been stemming up and boiling for the past couple of years. Um, and then also the other things that are intangible. It's we really use the product and in Fluida specifically. 
um, to make our employees look like rock stars. So if they're engaging with our um, with our customers every day, we want them to stand out, and we want to make sure that they are in the best light so that when they're actually going in for their renewal or they're going in for a strategic call or they're going in for um, you know uh, talking to them about a, something that they're working on, we want to make sure that our customers um, have the you know, have the best experience with our team, and so we always try to spotlight our team members to make sure that uh, they're doing the right thing, and right. Also that um, they're making a difference for the customer base. Um, besides that, you know, we have a job board as well. I mean, that's that's helped us find and circulate people that are moving throughout the organization, moving to other companies. Um, and typically, what happens if they move from, like, let's say, a consumer-facing brand to a marketing agency, um, they'll bring us in on site because they want us. They use us for a long time. They want to continue using us, and so um, you know the referrals from that has been tremendously valuable. Um, you know, for in terms of NPS, we've seen a huge growth, probably a thirty-point increase just by um, you know serving our customers within the hub and also looking at um, their satisfaction rating over time. And it's just been uh, tremendously valuable. That's a metric that the company has been looking at um, over the past right, couple right. of years, okay. um, and it, it's increased quite a bit, just like I mentioned. Yeah, one of my other questions was like, hey, how did you, how do you go about um, involving other departments and showing the value there? And the common thread that I'm seeing and hearing right now is simply just the the time savings of just like whether it's helping fill a position or getting product feedback for your your team, um, or maybe it's for sales, like you know helping them get better pipeline or better references. So, um, but I do want to ask how. Uh, so you, Kevin, how did you originally gain buy-in for your program before you even had any results? So you had an idea already of like what you want to track, but how did you convince others that hey, this is the this is the promised land? Come with. Yeah, um, one of the biggest things is like initially when I started working at NetBase, um, I worked with all the major stakeholders across the organization. So I looked at what is it that they're trying to accomplish in customer success. In sales, obviously, they're trying to get more leads, more referrals. Um, in marketing, we're trying to produce more content. We're trying to build out that awareness. Um, you know, even in finance, we're trying to reduce the amount of um, marketing dollars we spend on acquiring a new customer or retaining that customer. So I looked at across the organization, what is it that we're trying to do internally to build up um, more awareness for the company and also increase sales over time. So I basically positioned, um, this is the program we're trying to develop. We put strategic goals in place, like we're looking at engagement rate, we're looking at um, the number of referrals we can generate over time, we're looking at the number of marketing collateral pieces that we can create. Um, and that helped us frame the idea in mind that everyone felt like they are um, they have a sense of ownership in the, pro in the program. So it's not just marketing that owns it, it's across organization, everyone contributes to make this successful. So. It goes back to how do we onboard new clients? Well, we have to rely a lot on our account managers and our customer success team who initially takes on that new deal after it gets um, sold by the sales team. So we look at, okay, we need to be able to onboard these people successfully. How do we incorporate them? We need your help. We need to be able to make sure that it's not just um, one initiative and it's not just one-sided, but everyone gets the benefit from, from having this program in place. And so that's originally how we developed um, the buy-in, and that's really how we got people to become our biggest fans. Like, our employees love the product. They love the program. Um, they love everything that we're doing with it, and so it's all about how can we, we make it even more impactful in the future. Yeah, how can you make everybody win? I, I, I get it. Um, so, Carlos, over to you. I understand that your organization's uh, a little bit different in terms of buy-in. Uh, let's let's talk about that. Sure. We uh, Sridin has the the great fortune of having a visionary CEO and David Asif. He had the idea of uh, launching a customer advocacy program uh, in 2012. He he tasked that to Howard Turnoff, who is my boss um, and is still. And at the time, I didn't know what that was, so I did a lot of research, and we we launched a program. Um, we knew that we had customers who were doing some pretty great things with our products. Um, the Dayforce product is a leading edge technology. It's a true single solution uh, in the industry. There are all these disparate systems. So we had customers who are doing great things. And Stridi could say that all day long, but what really matters to prospects is when their colleagues, other customers, or other professionals talk about their successes. We wanted to give those successful customers a micro microphone and a platform to talk about their thought leadership, to talk about the success.
successes they've had. One, make sure they're successful today for us, but then also make sure they're professionally successful. And uh, so that we, we went forward with a, a program to really build out that advocacy um, networking and, and, and that uh, community of, of successful Dayforce customers who would benefit themselves personally by, by all the opportunities we put in front of them. Um, we give them opportunities uh, for ongoing human capital management, education, networking with other customers, uh, collaborating with Ceridian on products and service direction, and then also getting recognition personally for themselves for the great things they've done, for the leadership that they've had, the impact they've had on their organizations. And when they talk about that, it sure gives them recognition. But they also say, and I did it with Ceridian Dayforce and the Ceridian team. It's been so powerful. We started uh, getting buy-in just through uh, the reference program, but then as the, the program's grown, uh, I think most components of Ceridian are now uh, looking to the customer success program saying, hey, can I use customers for this or this or this? And we find everything from, uh, you know, we need some customers to, to do a presentation. We have our, our insights conference coming up in, a, in uh, the 11th in Las Vegas. We have over 40 speakers from the customer success program presenting their success uh, in front of other customers. Just fantastic. We have um, all this activity going on, and it's all rooted in, you know, that initial idea of can we get our customers talking about their successes in public? It'll have a great impact. Um, so it's it's grown phenomenally well and continues to grow. Hello. Yep. I apologize for that. Uh, my computer side take a an, an early long weekend, and I I whipped <laughs> back in shape. <laughs> Um, as we were saying, sorry, I, as we were saying before, um, you, you know, at Ceridian, you have the fortune of very forward-thinking uh, CEO in, in, in David. Um, I did have a question for that, though, is that if, if you had a, a tidbit that the audience could carry back for those that aren't of executive level, how would, mm -hmm. you, can, how, how would you inspire them to push forward the message to the upper, upper, upper chain? Uh, I would have them look at their, their department uh, challenges. And you, you ask engineering about its challenges without mentioning customer advocacy or something like that. It, it's uh, creating quality product and getting it out quickly. Uh, and that's a challenge that actually the, the answer to that is knowing what to create and having refinement done quickly. And the solution to that is the customer is giving that insight. If you mm -hmm. ask implementation, you know, what are your, object, uh, your challenges? It's probably high quality uh, implementations, quick time to return on investment and so forth. We found that when uh, customers are talking to other customers on the product, they talk about business objectives and business outcomes. Instead of, you know, Dayforce is a phenomenally robust product. If you have specific business outcomes in mind when you go into the project, you have a more well-defined scope for the project. and You have a, a quicker time to completing the project. So implementations objectives of having a quick, high quality, focused project we're more apt to, apt to having that happen if you have an advocacy program where customers are engaging other customers. You know, so what would it mean to you to have uh -huh. a quicker throughput and implementation? Uh -huh. um, and then uh, as they're ramping up in, uh, in support, what would it mean to you if your support call volume went down by a significant percentage because customers are helping other customers and alleviating some of that burden from support? So then by de department by department, we can help sales be more effective. We can help marketing have the content needed to be you know, effectively messaging out to the community with customer messages instead of Ceridian messages. We yes. can help engineering create product faster. We can have support, you know, uh, really focusing on the true support issues. Uh, it, it's just fantastic. We impact every department. The, the lowest hanging fruit is, of course, references and closing deals and referral yeah. business with hard dollar amounts. But when you get into other departments and you realize that, you know, their core core issues, the uh, infusion of the customer into those areas really has a, a phenomenal impact. See, and that's, that's the thing, for what it sounds like, like um, all of us on this, uh, on this call, it's organizations understand that you know, there's an advocacy imperative that lives within uh, the organization and how it could also impact other departments. It may start at references and referrals, um, but if you apply tracking and metrics that you wanna, uh, that you wanna help, that you wanna achieve, uh, then it can spill over into other things. It, it all comes back to the uh, the customers themselves. Uh, we're focusing on the customer successes. So while they're having these phenomenal impacts on certain departments, um, you know, we're we're tied at the hip of the customers. We want to be successful. They want us to be successful. 
and uh, all the activities that we present to them as opportunities in Advocate yeah. Hub have intrinsic value to them. They get more educated, more networked. They have a uh, you know elevation in social media clout. Um, they they put another feather in their cap and you know their LinkedIn profile from the recognitions we give them. So they realize you know I chose Serenity because Dayforce is the best product. I'm I'm staying with it because of that. But then also just personally and professionally, it's to my advantage to be a Serenity customer. Awesome. The customer first mentality and what's in it for yep. them first. Like I love it. Um, so getting back to you know uh, being able to uh, really highlight the customer and make them first, uh, we need to talk about how do we uh, essentially um, promote, share, or show ROI with uh, people around the company or executives. Um, and you know what? I'm going to go over to Kevin for this one first. Um, Kevin, do you have any tips on how to share um, your reporting or successes across your organization? Um, uh, you know, is it a big presentation once a quarter? Is it a monthly newsletter? How do you go about uh, sharing that? And let's talk to the other African markers that are tuned in. Yeah, I mean, I think um, even before you start, um, you know, socializing success of your programs or anything you're working on, I think it really comes down to like whatever CRM tool you're using, whether it's Salesforce or something else, having the metrics in place so that when you need to pull them later on, it becomes so much easier down the road. So having the dollar percentage in terms of like pipeline generated, number of referrals generated, um, results from a specific campaign, that all becomes a lot more easy and digestible once you have that those assets built out um, that you've already built out in the past. So in terms of like how we actually promote it internally, um, you know, some ways we actually do, uh, we actually have like a, a monthly marketing update that we normally do. Um, and then typically once a quarter, we also have more of like an all hands with the rest of the company. And so those times we actually give, you know, fr frequent updates as far as like what we're doing in Flutive, um, what we're doing in uh, the programs with customers specifically. And then um, we also do this, you know, to our customer base as well. So we let them know what are the big highlights that are taking place this month. That helps impact our customer newsletter that we put out, also just some of the challenges that are going on. We also try to spotlight the customers that are really doing amazing things with us. So if it's someone that did uh, created a new video or a new asset, that's something we want to socialize across the organization and also let our customers know because a lot of times they want to be able to hear the stories from other people instead of just from NetBase itself. And so that helps us encourage and really plant the seed like, hey, we're doing these videos, potentially you might want to do one in the future. Yeah. Uh, and also, it just helps us get, um, uh, we also, just in terms of the reporting side of it, we also look at, um, you know, when we do a net promoter score survey, we promote that out as well. Um, we track the engagement rate, engagement rate weekly and also uh, throughout the month, so that way, when we have a campaign that launches or just finishes up, we have more, um, I guess I'd say more meat to show. Yeah, to more data, yeah. Audience. And also like a yearly recap type of thing too. Oh, okay. Um, that's great. Um, so, Carlos, what is it like on your side for reporting into or sharing results internally? Well, I think we, we do this in a variety of ways. Um, uh, one thing that comes to top of mind, we had our, our, our sales kickoff at the beginning of the year, and uh, Ted Malley, our senior vice president, put a, a big number up on a PowerPoint in front of hundreds of people. And it was, I think it was $39 million. And it was actually the return on advocacy from that one small grocer, just to really drill home, you know, who is our most valuable customer? And, and it, it was eye-awakening. Customer success is, is a relatively young uh, strategy or, or industry or, or role. So that, you know, when the rest of the company is realizing, you know, the XOXO team, are they the reference team? Or are they, what, how do they impact the organization? Seeing that um, one individual from a company can have that kind of return on, on investment, that return on advocacy was so powerful. I think that really got the attention of a lot of people. But we also have like weekly metrics that we watch within our own team and we keep track of our, of course, our number of, of Uber advocates and references. We keep track of the engagement level in Advocate Hub. It's fantastic to see you know, what are we publishing? Are they finding it interesting and valuable and is our advocacy going up and down? We keep track of the, the new customers being introduced into the Advocate Hub, so we always have to have new customers coming in on, on the front end because uh, you never know who your next super advocate is going to be that's going to have that $39 million impact. Um, <laughs> we keep track of the uh, the bench uh, volumes that we have. I know with um, our user acceptance testing, we went from a couple dozen customers who were doing UAT testing to about 200 in a couple months to the point where they said, you know, 
we've, we've got enough customers. Now we can pick and choose if we want UAT testing from a certain vertical or segment or something like that. So, you know, keeping track of our, our inventory, so to speak, you know, how many people do we have who would be interested in being speakers, things like that. Uh, we present that out to our internal customers also so they know that they have this inventory of customers in, in areas that they can they can address. Um, okay. Yep. Okay. Um, that, that, so that, that's really insightful, um, Carlos. Um, I wanted to ask, though, when you said that your team looks at the metrics weekly, is that like a dashboard that you have in Salesforce? Is that, is that what you uh, send them? Uh, you, maybe you send them a report from your own uh, program that has reporting tools within, within the Advocate Hub, or is it something separate, like a, a nice little tight email that you, that you shoot off on Friday afternoon? What does that look like? It, it, in a meeting, uh, we have uh, Carlos's Corner, which is a, oh, a nice. section okay. of team meeting that I have, and a report out. We take a look at our, our run rate in Advocate Hub points. So we have a team goal on engagement. We want to make sure that our points on a monthly basis, you know, everything, every engagement in Advocate Hub has value to the customer, and there should be a, a level of, of points per month that we're tracking at. We have an annual goal that our team is incented on, so we want to make sure that we're at our annual run rate, and just so everyone knows, we are on our annual run rate uh, above that. Um, we have uh, the number of reference conversations that actually took place in the prior week, you know, how many engagements have we actually had. We look at, take a look at that. Uh, we take a look at the number of new members, and then there's normally a variable component in there as well. Something um, Right now we have our Insights Conference coming up in, in about uh, on the 11th of, of July, you know, how many of our XXO members are registered and going to be on site and know about our special experience you know, for the hub. So that's yes. something we're also looking at internally. Yes. Uh, making sure that they're aware of the, um, the experience that you can have. We're calling it XXO Live. We're bringing it all live to Las Vegas. Oh, there you go. There you have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. One other thing that I, I remember us chatting over um, uh, earlier is you, uh, you usually report some of the XOXO metrics in like sales kickoff meetings. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. How, was it just simply like a one slider on like, you know, dollar numbers that advocates are influencing? Like, how, how, what, what does that look like? That example, that was actually the thirty-nine million dollar number to, to get the attention of, of the audience. Uh, it's that, and also a bit of education. Um, depending on your company's, you know, situation, certainly is a very forward-thinking company. And um, you know, in twenty twelve, we were introducing the the idea of of. Uh, Customer advocacy, and uh, we branded it twenty uh, XOXO in 2013. So a lot of people saying, "What in the world is XOXO?" You know, so you know, in our annual conferences, sales kickoffs, we've gone through a, an evolution of awareness to uh, to now people really knowing that the XOXO program is where you go to engage customers, um, and each department knows that you know, that's the department they count on to to get the customer input to resolve their problems, whether it's sales, okay. marketing, engineering. Got it, got it. Okay, so gentlemen, we have eight minutes left in this session, and uh, you know I like to spice things up. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into a lightning round of uh, questions that our community uh, provided back to us. So I'll just direct the question to the individual, and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, within one or two sentences, uh, we'll we'll answer it, and uh, we'll first start off with you, Kevin. All right, you ready? I, I wish I had music and, and graphics, but hey, you know, where <laughs> Google, I'm afraid my computer might go back to sleep or something. So, um, the spot, so I guess. Few, yeah. So a few people uh, asked in our community, you know, how do you show slash prove ROI uh, for product feedback and maybe insights from your customers, which is hard to quantify, uh, especially with senior leadership? You may have answered it before, but uh, we're going to ask it again. Um. I think the, the main way that we show the ROI for like uh, the product feedback is if it's actually impacting um, deals in future deals that are taking place. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing is like if it makes a direct impact to, um, you know, if it's a feature request that is like high priority or just came out um, and this is something that's going to impact a renewal, that's kind of how we measure it. We look at um, what is someone saying, hey, can we make it a quick fix? Is it something that we can implement? and uh, impact in the roadmap like immediately. Got it. Got it. All right. In the spirit of lightning round, I'm going to shoot this one, and this one off to you, Kevin, uh, and then the next one over to Carlos. Uh, you know, basically, how do you track uh, the, reten uh, the ROI of retention? Um, we look at the... We actually look at the number of renewals that are taking place each quarter and each year. 
So we do that based on um, who's in the Advocate Hub today, how are those being impacted in terms of ret- renewals uh, that quarter or that year. Okay, love, love it. Short, concise, that's lightning. Um, Carlos, over to you. Uh, we're going to get really nitty gritty about, let's talk about challenge responses, and those are, in your case, opportunity responses uh, inside the XOXO program. Um, do you share those with your uh, customer facing teams? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, actually, uh, they're tremendously valuable. We we have us uh, we give our customers the opportunity to uh, provide you know insight on their experience, how it's impacted their organization, um, and actually, and also we tie their name and company logo to that, and we let them know you're a thought leader. You've done some great things. What's your opinion on this implementation or the uh, being a single product or the SaaS advantages, things like that, and customers love being quoted. Uh, so we take that content. Um, you know, one challenge could have you know 100 responses. We yeah. take that in, you know in the output and provide it to uh, sales teams, marketing teams. Perfect. They can take it through that, and they've got eloquent customer testimonials right right at hand. So we, we do that quite a bit. Okay, and uh, this is specifically from uh, Brittany uh, within Influida VIP. Um, how often do you do this? Is it a regular weekly cadence, or is it like whenever they issue an ask inside XOXO? Um, how, yeah, what is the frequency and to what degree? Because, yeah, you sound pretty sophisticated great about question. it. Yeah, a great question. So we have some things, like we have, uh, we're proud of our customers and we have an opportunity in the hub. We, you know, we're proud to have you as a customer, but we don't have your logo on file in our collage of customers. So we give them, you know, so that's something we update on a regular basis and our, our sales marketing team could at any time grab a collage of customer logos. So that's on demand. And then we have other situations where we may be working on a giant opportunity and we need uh, um, the testimonials in a certain area. Those come in sporadically, you know, so okay. a- as needed basis. Got so it. We so have a, so we have the XOXO, XOXO bank. <laughs> the yeah. XOXO bank, yeah. Whenever yeah. you want to make a withdrawal or deposit, just come visit us. Yep. Well, we're, we're yeah. there. Got it. Um, and Brittany also uh, asks, how do you avoid spending your days uh, essentially crunching numbers? So when you so from what it sounds like, all of us here are mainly looking at Salesforce, the the, the great reporting that's happening uh, within Influid yeah. Advocate Hub hashtag, uh, you know, selfless promote or selfless promotion. Um, it, how do you avoid uh, crunching numbers all day? I, I think that if it's quality on the front end, if you uh, for example, with marketing, we tie any time we provide a customer for a marketing campaign, we take that eloquent campaign number and we associate, you know, the request or whatever we fulfill to the campaign number. So on the back end, we can see which campaigns were impacted by customers. Uh, also, in, uh, Advocate Hub has some, you know, very nice reporting. So if I need to know uh, what the results were, I can go in and pull that out. Uh, we also have naming conventions for our activities, so we can take a look at uh, information in the back end. I think it, um, if you you do a little bit of Proactive planning on the front end, you can get the information out as needed on the back end. Nice. So we don't, we don't spend too much time actually, you know, diving into that. Sometimes diving into return and advocacy for one individual advocate, really getting into minutia, that takes a while. Right, right. Um, okay, and uh, last question on this lightning round. Uh, so Margot uh, was asking about low hanging fruit, Kevin, and she wants to know what is the low hanging fruit in terms of ROI measurement? That you can report, uh, you know, right out of the gate. Like, what should what should she be thinking about? Um, I think it really depends on like what uh, what are the core objectives with your program? Is it focused on lead gen? Is it focused on retention? Is it support? Whatever those goals are, then let's just say, for example, it's um, you know getting sales. Um, Low hanging fruit could be just number of references you're getting, the number of uh, referrals that you're generating. Those types of metrics would be specific for for that type of campaign. Right. Love it. Thanks for the concise answers, gentlemen. Um, So we are nearing uh, the top of the hour, and um, I actually wanted to ask one last quick question to Carlos, because we never had a chance to talk about it. Um, Carlos, I'm interested to know, uh, last time we spoke, you mentioned that you actually invite the majority of your customers into XOXO. It's not like you perfectly say, well, you you might segment, but it's not super exclusive. Um, Could you Talk a little bit about that, uh, maybe sure. for the next 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, Ceridian's flagship product is Dayforce. Uh, all of our Dayforce customers are invited, and we invite uh, the primary point person, and they often invite colleagues, so they invite coworkers. 
we found that you know customers who are Uber advocates and really happy, they enjoy the program. Other customers who come in and, and maybe they're you know having uh, going through implementation or they're early adopters and they're really looking to learn and, and improve their experience, they find the community as as valuable as well. So we invite everybody into the hub. And those, even those with a lower net promoter score, can find resources in the hub to network, collaborate with other customers, and elevate their satisfaction. So we, you know, we started with kind of cherry picking. We thought, you know, this is valuable for everyone in the customer base. We invite everyone into the hub. Yeah, and as a result, you can perfectly, you know, the more people you invite, you can segment and provide get get data points and completely. And we systematically yeah. direct them in the right direction based on their experience. Do they need more education, more tips and tricks? Take them that way. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so we're coming at the top of the hour, gentlemen. Uh, you know, thanks for playing along with the lightning round. Um, you know, as a wrap up, I'd like to say, like, you know, basically, as Me Kevin mentioned, you know, figure out what you want out of your program first, and then use that as a way to uh, develop metrics. And then after that, like every good marketer, uh, figure out a campaign, whether using Salesforce or something else, or in Fluido's uh, great reporting to then um, to just start reporting on those, creating campaigns. But essentially, hey, that's a wrap. Uh, you know, if you'd like to get any of your other questions answered, uh, please head on over to our VIP community if you want to continue this discussion. We have uh, both of our amazing African marketers here. Uh, we also have an ebook available on measuring ROI, and the links uh, will be provided on the right-hand side of your screen. And again, thank you, everybody, for joining in today. Carlos, Kevin, thank you so much for spending some time with us. And uh, we'll talk to both of you later. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.